Um, thanks everyone for joining our webinar this morning or this afternoon on where you are. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Mike Sintetos. I'm the policy director for the National Center for Sustainability. I'll be moderating the webinar today. This is part of a monthly webinar series sponsored by the National Center for Transportation. We're a uh, part of the University Transportation Centers program administered by the U.S. Department of Transportation. We're a consortium of six universities around the country focused on sustainable transportation through cutting edge research, direct policy engagement, and the education of our leaders. Uh, we do have a mailing list and uh, certainly encourage you to sign up to get notifications about future webinars and our publications st.ucdavis.edu. Today's webinar will last uh, one hour. We'll have a presentation from Susan Handy and then a guest response from Jeannie Ward-Waller of the California Department of Transportation. And then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. Please use the Q&A feature. Uh, if you look down at the toolbar, the bottom toolbar um, on your screen in the Zoom webinar platform, there's a little Q&A button. You can type your questions in there at any time and uh, we'll get to them as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. We will be recording this webinar um, and it will be available with closed captioning on our website along with the slides probably by tomorrow. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers. So we have Dr. Susan Handy today. Uh, Susan is the director of the National Center for Sustainable Transportation and she's a professor of environmental science and policy at California Davis. And Susan, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Mike, and welcome everyone for listening in today. It's um, kind of a funny time, or maybe uh, really an opportune time to be talking about reducing driving, uh, given how much we have reduced our driving in the last couple of months. Um, in the first weeks of the pandemic, we saw a decrease in the country. And we are all uh, ourselves seeing many of the benefits from this reduction in driving. Um, and the data rolled in suggests that many of these benefits are quite substantial. So the essential elimination of congestion, improved air quality, um, reduced noise, reduced crashes, injuries, and fatalities, although this uh, tendency to speed maybe offsetting some of that benefit. Increased wildlife roaming. I have loved seeing all the pictures of critters in our streets. Um, the repurposing of street space is another uh, favorite of mine. Uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions and so on and so forth. I'm sure I've missed, of course, these benefits all have secondary benefits that are, that are adding, um, adding to, um, to the total. So uh, the costs um, we've incurred to achieve these benefits, of course, are staggering and unspeakable. And uh, the benefits um, that we're enjoying are certainly minute in comparison to the cost. So I don't wanna downplay that. But I do think this unfortunate situation has let us experience uh, at least a little bit how nice it could be if we were in fact able to reduce dependence on driving through much gentler means. So these are the kind of benefits I talk about in this recently published white paper uh, that is the impetus for this webinar. Uh, and I think the question I asked there, what California gains from reducing car dependence uh, is still a very important and interesting question. Um, but of course, we have new questions now um, that we are all asking. Uh, what are the benefits if we can maintain some of this reduction in driving? And how would we do this? Um, and can we avoid even greater car dependence than we have now? So I'm going to start by um, going back to the first question and uh, talking about some of what's in this white paper. Uh, but I will come back at the end to talk about the, the new questions um, that we're facing around um, transportation and its future. Um, I do want to note that the white paper was never intended to be a thorough review of the evidence on all of the various benefits of reducing car dependence. 
um, but rather more of a, a framework to, to think about this range of benefits. So um, the situation prior to a couple of months ago is that we had seen a steady increase in BMT per capita for many decades uh, with a little bit of leveling off in the last decade that gave us a little bit of hope. Um, but even with that leveling off, this very high level of, uh, of driving measured as vehicle miles of travel or BMT is problematic for all kinds of reasons that we all know well. Um, in California, one of the primary concerns, of course, is the greenhouse gas emissions from all of that driving. Um, and it's clear that to meet the state targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions under Assembly Bill 32 from 2006, uh, we will need a whole lot of technological improvements, but we will also need to reduce how much we are driving. So AB 32 was followed by Senate Bill 375, which put in place targets for our metropolitan regions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from um, cars and trucks, and also put in place a requirement that our plan metropolitan planning organizations, or MPOs, prepare what we call a Sustainable community Strategy, or SCS, uh, in conjunction with their federally required regional transportation plans. Um, these SCSs are intended to outline the set of policies that the region is going to use, including land use policies um, that would get the region to its goals for reducing vehicle miles of travel. So, um, so that's, that's uh, much of the, the motivation behind this concern for reducing car dependence in California. Uh, one of the key points I want to make here is that we get a lot of benefits from reducing driving itself, but we also get a lot of benefits from those efforts, like those outlined in the SCSs, that we are making to reduce driving, whether they actually succeed in reducing driving or not. So if we reduce driving, we get direct environment, health, and economic benefits. If part of that reduction in driving comes from an increase in active travel, uh, we get more benefits, particularly health and economic benefits. And if we achieve an increase in active travel and a reduction in driving, in part from changes to the built environment, those changes to the built environment themselves can produce many important benefits for our communities in terms of equity benefits, as well as economic benefits and quality of life benefits. So we get benefits from these efforts, whether or not we actually succeed in um, reducing driving. Another important point to make, of course, is that uh, we have benefits both at the personal level and at the community level. So those who, who end up driving less accrue many benefits to themselves and to their households. But everybody's going to benefit if we, get, um, if we get at least some people driving less. And those benefits, the benefits accrue to the community as a whole. When I reduce my driving, in other words, I generate positive externalities for, for everyone. So the personal benefits to individuals and households um, include, again, a whole spectrum of things from reduced financial burden. American households spend on average over $9,000 a year to own, operate, and maintain their private vehicles. That's a lot of money that could do other ways. Um, if individuals drive less, they should experience improved health through less stress, from less time sitting in traffic, um, from less sedentary activity. Sitting in a car is sedentary activity that has a negative health impact. Um, they may get more physical activity that helps to improve health. And then again, these efforts to make it possible to drive less also improve access to opportunities, which is another important benefit to individuals and households. Community benefits, again, range across a wide spectrum, um, improve system efficiency, 
uh, from reduced dependence on driving. Um, other ways of getting around can be far more uh, energy efficient and far more space efficient than driving. Uh, we would see improved economic sustainability, improved environmental sustainability in a whole wide variety of ways, uh, improved public health, and along with that, reduced healthcare costs, uh, and improved social equity, that we would be um, providing better transportation for those who are uh, unable to drive for uh, one reason or another, and that um, involvement of, uh, you know, it, it, uh, bringing more people <laughs> into uh, the social life and the economic life of our communities benefits everyone. So uh, the big question is how to do it, and I think baking has been um, an important activity for a lot of us in recent weeks. Uh, so I thought I would use this image and share with you my easy as pie two-step recipe for how we would go about doing this. Although um, maybe a better metaphor here is uh, my pie in the sky thinking about how we might get this done. Uh, but here it is. So step one, we need to make it possible to drive less. That means using our land use policies and transportation investments to increase the mix of land uses in our communities, to improve connectivity, especially for uh, transit, bikes, and pedestrians, and make sure that we are investing in these other modes. Uh, in many places in the US, it can be really hard to drive less given the kinds of communities that we have built. So we need to redo things to make it possible to drive less. Uh, an important step one corollary that I think we often forget is that we also have to help people see how to drive less, which means improving the kinds of information that we provide about alternatives and also thinking about education programs to help people um, feel confident and comfortable using alternative modes. Okay, step two. After we make it possible to drive less, we need to make people want to drive less. And we've got the carrot option and we've got the stick option. So the stick option is that we make it harder to drive. We can do that um, through pricing as well as through outright restrictions on where cars can go. Um, neither of these approaches has been politically popular um, but I think that might be changing. We've already seen some uh, growing interest in using congestion pricing, for example, as a tool to help manage our driving. And uh, a lot of cities right now um, have already closed down streets, at least for the moment. Um, and that might, I hope, um, spill over into some long-term long thinking about how we can use street spaces in other ways. The carrot is to make it more appealing to drive less or even to think about making it cool to drive less so that people will naturally choose it. I think we have some opportunities here uh, to take cues from public health to think about how we can use design as well as social marketing uh, to help encourage people to drive less. And of course, we could go even further um, and use financial incentives, for example, uh, to help entice people to, to choose to drive less. So uh, all of that is easier said than done. Um, so one thing I do in the white paper is turn to some of the questions about how can we actually do this, some of the challenges we face in trying to um, both uh, make it possible to drive less and make people want to drive less. So I'll refer you to the white paper for the details here. Um, you know, some of these questions I think are still highly relevant. A few of them may be less so now given current conditions. Um, for example, the first question here, will Cal Californians accept higher densities? Um, we had some pretty good evidence to, to suggest that at least some people will accept at least moderate densities. A big question now about how attitudes about urban living may or may not change. 
um, does infill development necessarily lead to gentrification? That's one of the concerns about um, some of the efforts we're seeing in the state. Um, and I conclude that no, not necessarily, if we put the right policies in place. Would building more housing at the fringe be better? Certainly not if what we're focused on is trying to reduce VMT. Um, won't infill development increase congestion is a question that often gets asked. My answer is that yes, maybe in localized areas, but you know, it really doesn't matter if we're providing good alternatives and you don't need to get in your car to get to the places you need to go. Can driving be reduced without harm to the economy? Here, I think the answer is yes. And again, the, the, the condition is that uh, as long as we're providing ample accessibility through means other than driving, we can make it possible for people to do what they need to do without so much dependence on the car. Uh, other questions, will vehicle automation, what will vehicle automation mean for the goal of reducing car dependence? This is a big question to me. Uh, and I think, of course, the answer is that it depends on what sort of policies we adopt. I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, if we're encouraging more people to bicycle, doesn't that potentially mean more injuries and fatalities? Yes, the numbers may go up, but um, the more biking we get, and if we do it in the right way, the rates will go down. Uh, and so there will be a net positive there. Um, what about electric scooters? <laughs> that was a big question a couple of months ago. Maybe not such a big question right now, but I think what's important about the scooters, and, and I confess I'm a bit of a skeptic about them, is that, um, you know, they were, they seem to be a sign, at least potentially a sign of some fundamental change in how people were thinking about transportation. Um, and that was an encouraging thing. And then maybe the biggest question, the, the most challenging question of all is this question about what about rural areas? And is it possible to reduce car dependence in much lower density sorts of places? And that's one I really don't have a good answer to. So the way I think about it is that the, the, the general answer to the question of how to get it done is that we need a pretty significant shift in thinking in the transportation field. So for at least a century, we have been focusing on making it easier to drive. If we want to reduce dependence on driving, we've got to shift our thinking to focusing on making it easier to not drive. Uh, and that means thinking about accessibility as the ultimate end uh, of our efforts. I would say that we're maybe halfway there in this shift in thinking in that we are putting a lot of resources and time and energy into making it easier to not drive. Um, but at the same time, we still are putting a lot of resources and time and energy into continuing to make it easier to drive. Uh, these two things work against each other, and in a lot of cases we're doing both things in the same place, which to me does not necessarily make a lot of sense. So I think we're, we're kind of halfway there in our shift in thinking. Uh, and this question of autonomous vehicles, I think, is really looming over this effort to reduce dependence on driving. Um, the right policies could push this technology in a direction um, that reduces rather than increases dependence on driving. Um, but clearly, this technology um, you know, does have the potential to continue to make it easier to drive and may uh, make this, this goal of reduced dependence all that much more challenging. But I would just like to say that there is more than one way to go driverless. So again, I think we need to be shifting our thinking about all of this. Okay, back to today's reality. Uh, we've seen a huge crash, not just in driving, but in all kinds of travel uh, with really dire consequences for transit, as I'm sure you all are well aware. Um, transit is going to be absolutely essential if we want to get back some of that person travel without it having to be vehicle travel. Um, 
we're going to have to do something to ensure that transit survives and, in fact, revives. Um, at the same time that we've seen this crash in transit, we did see a, a decline in driving, but the latest data, this is coming out of um, uh, Apple's mobility trends reporting, shows that driving seems to be ticking back up as restrictions are loosening and people are becoming more restless. So this is a concern. And the big headline yesterday coming through my feed was this study uh, that looks at how bad traffic will be if driving rebounds, but transit does not. We could end up in a far worse situation than we had before. But that depends on a lot of things. So we have a lot of big questions right now about the future. How can we make transit safe and make people feel safe riding transit? Will transit riders return? Will workers continue to want to telecommute? Will online shopping accelerate? Will transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft even survive? What about all those wonderful new bicyclists? Are they gonna keep it up um, as things change? Um, will more people opt for space over access, meaning that we'll see an exodus from cities and a growth in population in lower density areas where it's harder to provide alternatives to driving? Um, will cars become yet more important to our daily lives in response to all of this? So these are really big questions that I would say we can't yet answer. And my email feed this morning, <laughs> Uh, lots of people out there asking these sorts of questions from, you know, what does this mean for changes in lifestyle and telecommuting um, to the question about transit recovery uh, to even the question about is this peak oil. So lots of people asking lots of questions, lots of us, including I'm sure all of you thinking about what kind of policies we can put in place to ensure that transit bounces back and that um, telecommuting and bicycling and some of these new habits we're forming persist. Um, just a lot, a lot of unknowns at this point. Um, and we will just have to wait and see to some extent. But the last point I want to make is that I do have some hope um, that what we're experiencing right now helps us shift from a mindset that we can't possibly drive less um, to a mindset that we can possibly drive less, that it's possible to do what we need and wanna do without driving so much. And as we are all experiencing right now, that we'd be far better off uh, as a result. So thanks, and Jeannie, I look forward to your comments and um, to questions and discussion with all of you out there listening in. Thank you, Susan. That was uh, uh, clearly a thought-provoking presentation because we already have lots of wide-ranging questions okay. flowing in that we'll be um, right. looking forward so I'm going to stop sharing. So um, before we get to the questions, um, I'd like to introduce our guest respondent, um, and that is Jeannie Ward-Waller. She's the Deputy Director for Planning and Modal Programs at Caltrans. And uh, Jeannie, I'd, I'd invite you to offer up your thoughts on the presentation we just heard and, and maybe talk a little bit about how Cal, uh, Caltrans is approaching some of these issues. Thanks, and, and thanks for the invitation and the, the really great presentation, Susan. I was taking notes on my uh, other screen um, while you were talking about other things that I'm thinking about and want to respond. So if I'm not looking at the camera, it's because I'm, I'm looking at my notes. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are so many things to unpack, and it, it, you know, it's such an interesting um, issue, as you said, Susan, to be reflecting on now. Um, with, you know, all of the sort of rapid changes in travel behavior and um, people's day-to-day -day, uh, schedules and, and, you know, restrictions that we're under. Um, so I, I think the first thing that I just want to reflect on um, is, 
you know, the, the, the equity implications of our current situation and be really, you know, sensitive and mindful to the fact that, you know, not everyone can stay home or work from home and many people are still driving. And so, you know, we want to, um, you know, of course, be mindful of essential workers and their needs. And um, for those folks that are out there traveling still, um, you know, the, the anxiety that they have about taking public transit and, you know, the needs that they may have to drive just to still get to their job, um, doing those essential services. Um, so that I think is important to, to keep at the forefront of our minds. Um, and also I was just reflecting on, um, you know, the, the fact that reducing driving is, is not really the same as reducing travel. And there are many disbenefits we are seeing to um, having less ability to travel as we're staying home. And, and so we, we want to unpack that. You know, certainly reducing driving has many benefits, but um, reducing travel means that we're not socializing, we're not experiencing, you know, cultural events and, and you know, many of the things we appreciate about our society going to restaurants. Um, and, and all the impacts that that's having to our economy and to people's jobs. So, um, so I want to separate out, you know, we want to provide people the ability to travel. And of course, as we're recovering, going back to traveling and, and accessing, you know, all of the benefits that we get um, from, from all those various things, but doing less of it in a car. So it's important, you know, for me to think about those differently. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly agree that uh, we need to provide more options so that people can, um, you know, access all those destinations easily and provide the right um, mix of incentives for land use and, and transportation system development in all our communities um, so that those destinations are easier to get to. Um, Thinking about you know your your points about sort of making it making it harder to drive versus making it easier to drive. Um, of course, we all know that the carrots are uh, much much easier from a political standpoint than the sticks. Um, and I think uh, you know pricing driving is one thing that um, you know I think we're we're going to have a particular challenge to talk about during um, you know an economic downturn. So that is one that, um, you know, curious to hear from folks in, in the participants on this webinar and others, but um, I think, you know, that's, that's one of those sticks that um, I think is, is gonna be even more challenging um, while it's also, you know, a, a really important and, and probably one of the most effective tools in reducing driving or making it harder to drive. Um, I think providing the incentives, and I think, you know, right now, particularly things like e-bikes, how can we incentivize um, e-bikes and their growing popularity, it, it could have a particularly valuable benefit. As you said, people are biking more and looking for more options. So, um, you know, I'm very hopeful about the potential of e-bikes. Um, and then, I think uh, you made this point somewhat, Susan, I want to unpack it a little bit more. I think public education and, and you know, being honest about the, um, the, the benefits of different strategies on both sides, making it harder to drive, making it easier to drive, um, you know, and the complexity of that. I mean, many of the strategies that we in the past have used to make it easier to drive, like, you know, widening roads and, and freeways, um, you know, we, we see over time that that's really just a short term effect. So we talk about it as an easier to drive, you know, it's going to relieve congestion, it's going to make it easier to drive. But um, of course, over the long term, it, with the, the development uh, effects of that and the induced demand effects, we actually over the long term see that it makes it harder to drive over a, a bigger um, area. And your picture of 101 is, uh, is an interesting one to use because you see the people driving in that scenario actually are not having an easy time driving. They're, they're sitting in congestion while, while waiting for that facility to, um, to be expanded. Um, and then, uh, you know, transit is, is kind of at the forefront of my mind and you talked about it towards the end there. I think transit absolutely um, needs to be at the core of our efforts and, um, you know, even more now because of the effects we're seeing on transit from um, this pandemic. 
it's certainly been you know all over the media and and we're especially watching closely what's happening in new york city and the the huge impacts they've seen to their system and also to their workforce um, and that's a city that you know has i think something like a 30 or 40 percent transit mode share um, so how New York City can recover where there is already pretty significant, you know, dependence on transit, I think is going to be very telling for, for the rest of us. Um, so I want to get to questions, but uh, before I do that, I, I just want to make sure to share a couple of things that Caltrans is doing in particular in this area um, that I'm very excited about and I think, you know, may help stimulate some discussion with the participants. Um, I, I'm happy to take questions on these things. Um, two, so I'll highlight two things. Um, the first is our California Integrated Travel Program, or CalITP, um, is the shorthand that we're using. Um, and this is a this is a program focused on our transit systems and better integrating um, transit, both for the agencies as well as for the users across the entire state. Um, we have over 300 transit agencies in California, and the vast majority of them are very small, um, providing you know rural, rural and smaller community transit service um, with very small operating budgets, and many still rely on um, cash fare box collection. Um, so you can think of, um, and you know, we're we're very concerned about um, with the pandemic. You know, there's a huge push to reduce cash use and, and cash collection um, and the exposure that that creates to the transit operators themselves. Um, so how can we help transit go cashless and um, and you know all, all the the benefits of that um, and also help users understand um, you know when they're waiting for the bus not just when the next bus is going to come but is that bus full or is there social distance space on that bus before I even get on it um, and so that people can plan their trips and and trust that they can get back on transit safely so what Cal ITP proposes to do is there's kind of three, three main goals of Cal ITP. The first is to provide um, data, better data services in real time to ensure that um, users have access to reliable and accurate real time transit information. Um, and, and our hope is to get the whole state onto um, GTFS. Uh, standards for for um, transit data which which does provide that platform um, to you know integrate into Google Maps or Apple Maps um, so that people can you know see when when their uh, next transit vehicle is coming and plan their trip um, in a in an accurate and, and reliable way the second initiative of Cal ITP is to reduce friction in payments. So we're working on um, a, a statewide payment system that will again support the ability to be cashless and, and make contactless mobile payments on transit again across the system, you know, with the with those smaller agencies kind of in mind in terms of who will most benefit, which agencies will most benefit from that. But it also makes it much easier for the user. To, um, to pay for transit in a seamless way. They don't have to have a unique card for each system to be able to um, get on a transit system. The third goal of Cal ITP is to um, create a statewide eligibility verification program. And this is um, really with uh, users, um, more vulnerable users in mind, lower income people, seniors, students, um, people who, who need a transit benefit um, or discount to be able to use uh, transit more effectively um, and, and making that an easier system across the state to actually um, verify people's eligibility for that program. And we think the state is most, um, is set up best to do that. Um, so those are the goals of Cal ITP. Um, you can find a, a feasibility study that we've just released on our website. Um, and I'm happy to, to share the link um, for that. Um, but there's, we're putting out some information and getting a lot of interest from transit agencies on that right now. So it's, it's something that's very timely and, and we're really excited that the state is doing some leadership work in that area. Um, and the second uh, thing that Caltrans is working on that um, I'll highlight just briefly, I'm sure you all know quite a bit about it, so I won't talk at length about it, but happy to discuss it, is SB 743 and the, the uh, implementation of that, um, which, you know, the, I'm sure you all know the <laughs> official deadline for um, 
trans transitioning to VMT from level of service is July 1. Um, so we are very focused on that um, looming date and Caltrans is working on a number of guidance documents um, that support um, different aspects of our work, our review of land use projects and their impacts to the state highway system. Of course, our own traffic analysis um, process, including induced demand, um, and then also our, our process for environmental analysis of transportation projects. Um, so there's three guidance documents and, and probably more coming that we're, we're working on um, in the future, but those are the primary ones that we're working to release and adopt by September. Um, so those are just two things I wanted to make sure you all are aware of that Caltrans is doing and um, I will stop there I think with my reflections so we can get to questions and discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot Jeannie. Really appreciate you sharing your perspective and um, we'll certainly ask you to stick around and, and uh, help, help us tackle some of these questions um, which we have a lot of and I, I just want to apologize in advance to everyone that we're not going to get to all of them but we'll, we'll do our best. So um, Susan, maybe we can just start with the foundational one. Um, the title of your presentation was reducing car dependence. And, and the question is, is there, is there a measure of car dependence for like a community or a region? Um, is, is it just kind of just VMT or is there some other measure of, of how dependent a uh, community is on, on vehicle travel? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, we often fall back on VMT as a measure of car dependence, you know, how much people are actually driving. But I think there's, you know, there's an important distinction between how much we drive and how much we have to drive or whether our driving is by choice or by necessity. Um, and uh, we don't have nice standardized ways of measuring that sort of that, that kind of dependence rather than the behavior. Um, but it is closely tied to the idea of accessibility, I would say. And a lot of communities are looking at accessibility measures uh, as an alternative to the standard way we think about transportation in terms of level of service. So accessibility measures like, you know, what can, how many jobs can you get to by transit within a certain amount of travel time? Or um, I like the neighborhood scale accessibility measures like, you know, what, what's the distance to the nearest store? Is the store within walking or biking distance? Um, there's a really nice idea from Europe that I really like. Um, the Germans call it um, uh, Stadt der Kurzen Wege meaning the, a city of short distances. Um, and now cities like Paris are talking about a 20 minute city. You know, it's the idea that you can have most of what you need within a very short distance. And if you have that, you're gonna be much less car dependent. So I think that's really a nice way to think about what we're, what we're talking about here, is trying to create more of those kind of 20 minute cities. So um, the next question I thought was pretty interesting, um, asking about the intersection of climate adaptation and active transportation and how you know, we're anticipating more and more extreme heat days and severe weather events um, that can make biking and walking um, uncomfortable at the least and, and potentially um, unsafe. And so the question is whether either of you have any thoughts on um, on adaptations for, for um, local governments could, could make to, um, to create a more resilient um, active transportation system? Yeah, not a really good question. It's funny, I was on a webinar last week where I got asked about biking in cold climates, <laughs> which is an issue. But of course, being in Davis, I always think about the, the hot weather issue. Um, yeah, it's a concern and it ties into the need to make sure we've got good tree canopy, right? It's gonna help with heat island effect and things like that. But Janie mentioned e-bikes and uh, I'm a big believer in the potential of e-bikes. And in fact, um, you know, I was a little skeptical when jump bikes came into Davis because I thought, why do we need bike sharing? Because everybody here has bikes. But the fact that they were e-bikes was really important because, um, you know, it does get really hot here 
And, you know, it's nice to have that electric assist, which lets you continue to bike in hot weather without getting quite so sweaty. So that's, that's my easy answer is that I, I think, I think we got to look at e-bikes and figure out how to get more people, get, give access to e-bikes for more people. Jeannie. <laughs> Yeah, I, to I totally agree, Susan. I think e-bikes provide, you know, longer range, more flexibility, certainly easier use in the heat. So I think e-bikes are, are great and I'm a huge proponent. Um, but also just more options and more varied options, I think, are, are valuable. So, you know, scooters are, scooters are creating a lot of challenges, but they are one more option and different types of people I've seen, you know, different different people want a different travel option. So it, it's certainly giving giving people other options. It seems to always have a benefit and, um, you know, feel make people feel less like they need to rely on a vehicle, um, which is, you know, as we're talking about here, part of the goal. I think the climate adaptation question is a really interesting one. And, um, you know, for me, it makes me think of the importance of you know, engaging with communities when we're designing our facilities. There are so many issues around, you know, and in addition to just having the right facility, you know, it's not about just having a sidewalk or a bike path or a bike protected bike way in your community. It is about having tree canopy or having street lights or, you know, just the, the perceptions, the feelings that people have when they're walking and biking are just as important as the infrastructure that we're building. Um, so, you know, I know many places where people say, I don't want to walk in my community because there's loose dogs. And, you know, that may not be something the transportation agency is thinking about at all, but it, it's, it sort of represents the importance of engagement and understanding um, the needs of the people you're designing for and making sure you're thinking about all the things um, that go into people's decision to, um, to travel in a certain way. And so I think the climate adaptation is, is just one more of those things, but is really important. And the green green infrastructure, trees, you know, uh, other other landscaping um, can make it so much cooler on, on the street. But um, I think weather overall, you know, we, we talk about the effects, but uh, my sister lives in Alaska in Anchorage and she bikes year round. So I think if you sort of have the right uh, equipment and mindset and, you know, again, facilities, um, weather can become less of an issue. Uh, but but safety is certainly a, a key one. So safety in, in all in all aspects is something really important that we need to all be thinking about. We, um, the e-bikes e have clearly resonated with some folks on the webinar. We've got a <laughs> couple of people ch chiming in and one person um, say, uh, also making a plug for e-bikes as a good tool for older demographics and people kind of less, less comfortable on, on traditional bikes. So um, you got some support for e-bikes there. Um, we get, we got a question um, kind of about about symbolism and how um, you know the, the 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 fast snazzy expensive car is the status symbol in our society and the question is how do you how do you kind of recreate that around um, you know how do you make active transportation modes uh, uh, into into more of a, a status symbol that could compete with that you know that imagery that, that has such uh, prominence in our culture. That is a big challenge. Um, you know, I think biking to some degree has started to take on some of that coolness factor in urban areas among millennials or gen, whatever, whatever they are now, Gen Zers. Um, I think bike sharing was, has been kind of a part of that as well. Um, you know, which isn't to say that we're going to turn everybody from cars to bikes, but, you know, if you start to build that, that culture, that sense of, yeah, this is the cool hip thing to be doing, you know, then, then that starts to go somewhere and people start to build some habits that they may carry forward and they're doing it because it actually really makes sense for them and not just because it seems like it's what their friends are doing. So I don't know. It's it's really challenging, but I think I think we can do we can do it a bit. 
Um, I think what's happening right now, you know, and with people getting out more on their bikes and walking, people are walking all over the place, around their neighborhoods, you know, some of that starts to change how people think about these, um, these modes. Um, and again, I'll mention public health because of course they've been really effective at using social marketing to change how people think about different sorts of behaviors. So um, we, I think we have lessons to learn from some of the, the kind of techniques they've used. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I'm, I'm not a marketer, so it, it's a good question, but I may not be the, <laughs> have the expert answer on that. I, I do think, you know, I've noticed a trend in, you know, the last five years or so that more car commercials actually have bike imagery in the commercials. Yeah. So that's an interesting thing to reflect on that bikes are becoming, you know, cooler and, and more trendy for, I think, again, it's, it's somewhat generational. It's kind of marketing towards a younger demographic, but using bikes to help market vehicles, which is, which is very kind of, you know, we might see it as a perverse <laughs> kind of marketing, but um, but there, you know, there, there's there's probably you know actually a really interesting trend in there that we should um, that we should use to our advantage. So I do think um, you know the more vehicle marketing has been very much about freedom, and I think the fact that that becomes less and less people's actual experience in their car may uh, may also undermine that strategy over time. And I think bikes do still kind of carry that feeling of, of freedom and, and that is an opportunity to market um, bikes in a different way. But um, having worked for the Bicycle Coalition, I, uh, <laughs> I sometimes feel like the bike industry is, is not quite as good at this as, as the car industry is. Um, and, and so, you know, we'll, we'll just see over time if they get better at it. But um, yeah, certainly it's, I think it's generational. I think it is changing and, um, you know, the less cars represent what they did, you know, 50 years ago, I, I think it, it, the, the conversation around marketing different modes will change quite a bit. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we got a question about um, reducing car dependence um, for people kind of at different life stages, Susan. Um, so the question was specifically about, you know, families with young children where, you know, obviously shared micromobility isn't an option. And, um, you know, you maybe are a little more limited in how you can get around. Can you speak to, um, you know, whether it's appropriate to kind of look at strategies tailored to people in different stages of their lives, or is there more of kind of a, you know, one size fits all solution or, or how to approach that issue? Yeah, I think definitely it's about tailoring the solution to the demographic. I mean, I'm not saying, and I don't think anybody is saying that everybody needs to get out of their cars. I mean, because they're clearly people who need to drive and they're, you know, everybody at certain times of life driving you know, is clearly the best way to get around, if not the necessary way to get around. Um, but I do think we can be a lot more creative about this. Uh, so, of course, I'm here in Davis, bicycle capital of the U.S., uh, and you, you, you see a lot of parents with young kids, Mike included, who carry their kids um, on their bikes. And, you know, partly that's a resource issue, but it partly it's an education issue is, you know, helping people understand um, that there, you know, that there are these kind of bikes that could work for this purpose, you know, that it is possible to do this. Um, we did a study some years ago where we interviewed parents in the Bay Area who were using e-bikes to transport their kids in places like San Francisco and Berkeley and Oakland. Um, yeah, and of course their friends all think they're crazy, but for them, it's the best way to get around. And for one reason, they don't have to deal with parking. <laughs> you know, it's so much more convenient to get around on a bike. So yeah, I think there's a tailoring that needs to be done, uh, but also education and some creativity about what kind of options might work in different situations. Um, thanks. Yeah, so, so next question. Um, is um, I guess regarding the, the relationship of reducing car dependency with vehicle electrification. And I'm wondering if um, Susan or maybe both of you could speak to, you know, if, if we, if we electric, you know, if we are able to electrify our vehicle fleet, do, 
do all of our problems go away and we, we don't even need to have this conversation? Our problems do not all go away. Um, it, it certainly makes a huge difference, but analysis that the Air Resources Board does, you know, shows that, um, you know, that's a, that's a process that takes some time. And if we're going to meet the state's targets for GHG emission reductions, even with the, you know, a pretty um, optimistic estimate of what we can do with electrification, we're going to have to reduce how much people drive because we have a lot of non-electric vehicles out on the road that people are using. Um, even if we were entirely electric, there's still lots of impacts from our car system that we need to worry about, like all that pavement that we have out there um, that um, itself has environmental costs and needs to be maintained and has huge economic costs. Um, and if we electrify trucks, they're going to be much heavier and then that's even more wear and tear on the road. So, so absolutely we need to be aiming, I think, for reductions in vehicle travel regardless of electrification. Uh, and then, of course, there is that little issue that when you get an electric vehicle, you feel a little less guilty about your driving and you may end up doing it more, which I would, I confess is probably true in my household. Yeah, Mike, I'll add to that. I mean, I, I think the, the question fundamentally is only asking about one piece of the benefits that we're talking about, right? It's like, can we attain this GHG emission reduction target if we just electrify all our vehicles? And I think if you're only looking at that piece, which is sort of a simplistic view on, you know, all the other things that Susan captured in her presentation that are you know, the, the needs and the benefits of, of travel, um, you, you know, the, the answer is still no. <laughs> the projections of, you know, electric vehicle uptake and, you know, changing over the fleet and um, the, the um, uh, embedded carbon in our fuels and, and how quickly we can switch that over, we still don't reach our goals um, with, with just electric vehicles and fuels uh, alone. And, and the federal government is making that even harder for us in California. So I think pressure is even more on BMT reduction because we are going to be, a, we are, we are, it's looking like we're going to be able to achieve less on the electrification side than we were anticipating. Um, but I think, you know, from Caltrans point of view, you know, in a lot of our urban areas and our metro areas, our system is fully saturated. We are carrying as many vehicles on our system as we possibly can for many hours of the day. Um, and actually less because there's so much congestion. You actually carry fewer vehicles because they're moving so much slower. Um, so we, we do not have an ability within our current system capacity to move more vehicles around our metro areas. Um, so the, the only other way to do it is to give people other options and incentivize those other options. Um, so reducing vehicle travel, you know, per capita in particular, if you want to um, be specific about it, I think is, is, is critically important to just continuing to travel. And we have a growing population, you know, we're going to hope our economy uh, bounces, you know, bounces back in, in a year or two out of this crisis. And, you know, people are going to want to travel again. We cannot um, carry all those people in, in single occupant vehicles. We have to have other options. Good answer. Um, so we got a couple questions. Um, we've been we've been talking, I think, mostly today about passenger travel, but we got a couple questions about goods movement. Um, one of which was, you know, what are the implications of making driving more difficult, like through some of the means we've been talking about, through pricing or um, or vehicle restrictions? Um, what what are the implications of those actions on goods movement and are there ways that we can um, still make sure that we're facilitating goods movement um, while achieving some of the goals that we've been talking about today? Yeah, so one way I, I think about this idea of reducing driving is that some driving is more important than other driving. So maybe your commute to work or getting to a doctor's appointment, absolutely critical. But uh, just going out for a leisurely drive, not so essential. So, you know, what we want is a way to uh, discourage the less important driving. 
And what's nice about that is if we can find a way to do that, then, um, then the conditions get better for the necessary driving, right? So if, you know, if, if we succeed in uh, encouraging, um, you know, people, individuals to do less driving, to get to where they need to go by other means, um, then it should improve conditions for, for goods movement. Um, but even on the goods movement side, I think we need to be thinking about what's, what's more important and what's less important by way of goods movement. So um, same day Amazon delivery, you know, not such a great thing for a lot of our societal objectives. Two day delivery, according to my colleague, Miguel Hayer, not so bad, but do not order same day unless you absolutely need it same day. So by making that, you know, free to Amazon Prime members, um, that is contributing to um, a lot of our problems. So, so I think both on the passenger side and the goods movement side, what we want to do is discourage the less important, less efficient travel. And that makes things better for the, the driving that needs to be done. Yeah, Mike, I'll add, I think, uh, you know, we, we do already treat goods movement differently and we price, we price it differently. You know, we're trucks primarily using diesel fuel, that's taxed differently. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we already do kind of separate out goods movement, but then, you know, when the big trucks get on our system, they just like commingle with all the other vehicles and general purpose lanes. So there are many ways where we can design our system so that we do treat trucks differently. And, you know, the coming in from the border of Mexico is a good example. You know, there's a different, there's a different port of entry for, um, for trucks. And, and so there, there are, you know, different, I think, design strategies that we can use um, to, to have, uh, you know, to, to move goods independent of, you know, all the other vehicles traveling on the road. Certainly the, you know, freight rail system is, is prioritized <laughs> over passenger rail. That's another way that we can really efficiently move goods and, and separate it out from um, passenger travel. So uh, yeah, there, I think there are a number of strategies and many of which we could, could use much more in California and more effectively. Um, so yeah, that's another whole conversation probably, but an, an interesting one and um, lots of lots of potential solutions. Well, those are good answers. And I think they kind of segue into another question we got um, that, that, that point about, you know, not all travel is created equal. Um, we got a question about, um, about pricing, congestion pricing um, or pricing driving somehow. And um, the question is that, you know, if we're, if one of our goals for trying to reduce driving is to, you know, promote a more equitable society um, is is pricing driving, um, you know, actually, you know, penalizing or disadvantaging uh, more vulnerable populations, you know, people who are low, low income, but have to drive um, for work or for, you know, for, for whatever reason. And so, um, it, you know, is, is there is there a way to to still kind of, you know, send that signal to reduce driving without, you know, hurting the, the segments of our population that, that we're, we're hoping to, to help. Yeah, I absolutely think there are ways we can do it so that we can, we can do the pricing thing, but also uh, address the equity concerns. Um, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, well, for one thing, if we're, if we're collecting revenues through the, the pricing scheme, that money can be funneled into the alternatives and that helps to address equity. But, you know, there's also ways to do differential pricing so that uh, lower income households more dependent on cars, you know, there's a way to charge them less than people who are uh, with more means or with more uh, options. So, um, that, I mean, that's the, the ivory tower pie in the sky <laughs> view of it. Jeannie might wanna comment on the political reality of trying to do this, it's much, much harder. 
No, you're absolutely right, Susan. I, I think there's lots of ways to do it and, and make it, you know, very progressive in terms of the way the pricing is set up. I think I think the, the counterpoint that I want to make to this question is that there are lots of uh, regressive ways that we're pricing and paying for the system now. I mean, sales tax measures is probably the worst, the worst example. Everyone is paying sales tax all the time, no matter how much driving they're doing. And yet, in, in you know, most of our, our self-help uh, sales tax measure counties, we're using that to fund capital expansions on our system. And, and you know, in some places like Los Angeles, most of that is being funneled into building a new subway, which is, which is providing alternatives. But in, you know, many, uh, many cases, we're, we're still continuing to uh, use it to help increased driving so uh, that you know that there's an issue with how we're doing it now and so I think can we do it better with new pricing schemes yes and and we absolutely should I think that's it's an important point to to put it in the context of how we're currently paying for transportation great thank you so I, I think we're gonna we're gonna make this our last question. Um, we're running out of time here. Um, the number so, of questions keeps going up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I yeah. No, I'm not clearing them out very well, but we're we're probably not going to get to those 80 other questions. <laughs> um, so we got a question about um, you know there's there's kind of this um, this war on cars narrative that's. Um, that's um, building up around some of these strategies like, you know, closing down streets to car traffic and things like that. Um, and, is, and is creating pushback um, to, to um, um, you know, to, to building up infrastructure for some of these alternative modes. Do either of you have advice for how to kind of counteract that narrative? Um, is, you know, you know, clarifying, you know, car, you know, we're looking, we're looking for car light rather than car less, or um, are there other, um, other strategies that either of you can, can suggest? Yeah, I, th I do think we need a way to talk about it that, that doesn't provoke that war on cars reaction, because that's, you know, that's really not the idea. I mean, personally, I see cars as that's a war on our communities <laughs> that we have put you know, so much into um, accommodating cars within our communities to the detriment um, of quality of life. So it's really about a sort of rebalancing of our priorities and making sure that we're, um, you know, adequately, you know, adequately accommodating and thinking about the needs of people when they are not in their cars. Um, the whole idea of complete streets is, is about that idea of rebalancing. But yeah, your the question is exactly right that I think we do have to be careful about how we talk about this so that you don't get that, that very adversarial sort of um, discussion going. Jeannie probably has some good ideas on this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. It, it, and I think it feels like a war on cars or it might feel that way to some people because people we are so dependent on driving and it's you know the the so many of our trips are made by driving that it feels like you know making that more difficult is is a war on cars but actually just the nature of you know more and more and more and more driving you know it's it's this sort of like un, uncontrolled growth that we cannot sustain and so it's it's actually just the reality of uh, the you know size of our communities and the growing population and you know we, we it's it's not a war it's just the the sort of natural constraints that we're we're feeling and we need to be thinking about alternatives so i think um yeah we're 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 trying to be sensitive. I think we've we've been pretty sensitive through this whole through this whole conversation. But um, we're absolutely not saying that people can't or shouldn't drive. There there are still huge benefits to driving, and and people need to do it. And it's still how our system is primarily designed. That that's that's uh, for many people the easiest way to get around. Um, but we do need to provide other options and and incentives and start moving in the direction of carving out space for for those alternatives and that's kind of the only way to continue to travel in the the way that we have traveled so easily for 
um, for the past decades. So we're just we're just reaching the natural <laughs> constraints of the system that we built, and um, alternatives are needed to yeah continue to support travel. So I, I wouldn't consider it a war on cars at all, and I think that's that's the wrong way to think about it. It's more just the need for other options and and more efficient ways to get around. Yeah, great. Well, hey, I really want to thank you, Susan, and thank you, Jeannie, for participating today and sharing your insights with the group. Um, I mean, given the, the, the volume of questions, I think there's there's clearly a lot of interest in this topic, and really want to thank our audience for all the great questions and um, apologize to those of you we didn't get to. Um, but um, yeah, only an hour today. Um, I just did want to remind everyone that you'll be getting an email following the webinar with a short survey, um, and we'd love to get some feedback on, on how we did. And, um, and um, just again, one more reminder that the slides and the recorded presentation will be available on our, web on our website, ncst.ucdavis.edu. And, uh, and with that, we'll adjourn, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Fun. <laughs> be safe.